Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle. I will be joined by my two co-hosts, Reed and Hall, here very, very soon. But the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. The title of tonight's episode is Brass Knuckles, because that's just how I'm feeling after listening to Joe Witt's uh, introductory press conference, which was absolutely amazing. But to talk about all the latest news that we, that has developed, brought on from Locked On Commanders, Mr. Um, David Harrison. How are you doing on this beautiful Thursday evening, sir? Oh, I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for the invite. Seriously, thank you for taking some time, Alex. I know you had to speed home uh, from those pressers, and I'm sure that you had uh, some heavy metal going li- after listening to uh, <laughs> Wit talk as well. But kind of, what what was your biggest takeaway from these press conferences of Cliff and Wit, who both <laughs> are very, very different? Uh, they're they are very different, definitely night and day as far as personalities are concerned. But you know, that's that's what you need to balance out a good staff, right? But I think the biggest takeaway you have to take from not just these two guys, but also listening to Dan Quinn, Adam Peters, Josh Harris's teamwork, right? Like this is truly a team effort. And it's not just kind of your generic, like, oh, we're gonna work together, we're all gonna work, you know, side by side and and all this stuff. I mean, they're putting pieces in place to make sure that every single part of this operation, every single part of this football team has input from someone who is an expert in something, right? So there's an old saying, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, right? Well, mm-hmm. that kind of when you apply that to coaching, this is this is one of the reasons why I personally am very happy that Dan Quinn is not going to be coordinating his own defense, and he's going to be allowing Joe Witt Jr. to be the full defense coordinator, call the plays on game day, because that allows Dan Quinn to kind of be that floating leader to check on everything and make sure these guys' hands touching everything. But then within those systems, you have your coordinators who are overall responsible for each side of those, the ball, and, and obviously Larry Izzo will be in charge of the all-important third phase that we never talk about. But then he's also got pass game coordinators, run game coordinators, defensive you know position coordinators within those, and obviously you have your position coaches. And then you've got a chief of staff, which is something that I don't even feel like I'm fully smart enough about to really dive deep into yet, but something that I look forward to to finding out next week when we meet all these assistant coaches because you know I know what a chief of staff generally does, basically coordinate communication, make sure everybody's on the same page. So not only do you have all these little parts covered by a specific expert and someone who's, uh, whose focus is specifically there, then you got another person whose job it is to just basically make sure that everybody is on pat on the on the same path in their in their little minutia that they're dealing with. So I mean I think that uh, you know too many more, and you might get to the point where it's like too many cooks in the kitchen. But right now, I think you have a really good balance of expertise and knowledge coming into making sure that everything is going the way that they want it to go. Yeah, to branch off of that, I've heard people say, well, like there's too many people here, a lot of former head coaches, like you said, too many cooks in the kitchen. I was actually going to say that I wrote that down. <laughs> what your Do you think, so obviously you don't think it's gotten to that point yet, but has it something that crossed your mind? I mean, obviously, you know, I think it has to cross your mind. You, know, you see all these 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 names come out, and then today the commander sent out their official list of their 2024 coaching staff, and you just look at the names on here, and you're like, man, like, I, you know, this is a lot of people you're going to see out there, you know, on the football field and doing all these things. And really, at the end of the day, it, it could be too many, right? And the only, the only way you're going to find out if it is too many is once the execution takes place. And really, that's all about ego, you know what I mean? And But if, if this entire staff takes on the personality of Adam Peters and Josh Harris and Dan Quinn, I mean, just from the very beginning of this, right? What's the first thing that Josh Harris did once he decided, okay, we're going to be shifting paths. He went out and he got buddies. He got help. He got smart people to advise him on the situation. And so from the jump, this thing has been all about teamwork and, and working together and, and leaning on each other's expertise. So Josh Harris brings in Adam Peters and even Adam Peters, he leaned on some of the other people that Josh Harris brought in to help find the new head coach. And now Dan Quinn is coming in and the ultimate, team mentality right is i'm not going to have 100 percent control of any facet of this so that i can have total control over the direction the boat is being steered so this isn't just a head coach who's telling his staff hey you work together you work in concert with each other no he's doing it himself as well so really what it boils down to is ego everybody has ego i've had this old saying that if you ever meet somebody who tells you i don't have an ego it's actually the most egotistical person you're ever going to meet because they're what they're telling you is They don't have something that every other human being is born with. No, everybody's got an ego. The question is, does your ego get in the way? And Mm -hmm. that's where I think some of the concern of look at all these former head coaches, look at all these guys with all this experience. Is there going to come a day where they're in the room saying, I've been doing this for X amount of years. I led this team. I've got this win-loss record. Da-da-da-da-da. You need to listen to me. It could. 
I mean, that's the truth. It could have come. But if it sure. doesn't, and as long as everybody stays on that same page of servant leadership and teamwork, then it won't be too many cooks in the kitchen. It'll be a, a plethora of information to make sure that you make the right decisions on game day. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about Brian Johnson being named the assistant head coach? I know a lot of people like to make out like because and I completely understand w with a lot of it. I mean, Philly's offense kind of fluttered out last season, but obviously the guy mm -hmm. is good at what he does. That's the reason he became an offensive coordinator. Right. So passing right. game coordinator, complete sense. How do you feel about the assistant head coach title over guys like Anthony Lynn? Um, I think that when you talk about an assistant head coach, the question that really had kind of has to follow up that we don't have the answer to right now. And honestly, some staffs are super tight lipped about that kind of stuff. We may never get the answer. Uh, like with Eric B enemy, we knew what that meant. You know what I mean? We knew what that role in title entitled for for EB right now. I don't personally know what that means for Brian Johnson. That's something that I look forward to talking to him about next Wednesday when we get to meet all these other coaches. But the, the end of the day is, if Dan Quinn is looking at Brian Johnson to be someone who's going to help him execute those head coaching duties, then there's a reason for him to do it. As far as how that relates to what happened in Philadelphia, the jobs are completely different, right? And what went wrong with Brian Johnson in Philly, I think it's important to, to kind of understand how those things went wrong. What you ended up happening or having was a quarterback coach that becomes an offensive coordinator, and it's his first year having to craft his own game plans, play – uh, call the plays and I don't know that people really fully understand what all that entails when you're on the sideline or even in the press box in the midst of an NFL game like uh, a 25 second game clock a 40 second game clock like however much time you have on the game clock like you stand in a room and run a stopwatch that has you know 40 seconds on it 25 seconds it feels like forever but when you've got the headset on when you've got all these plays in front of you when you've got the livelihood of all these players and everything going on in the building in your control that is nothing that goes by uh, in, in the blink of an eye. So when you talk about coaches, like, why doesn't he ever adjust? Well, when we're sitting back home on the couch or sitting up in the press box, eating our hot dogs and, and all this stuff, it feels like plenty of time to see these things and understand them. But when you're wearing the headset, it goes by a lot different. What Brian Johnson needed last year was a leader on the field to help him get through the weeds when he got stuck in them. That's where Nick Sirianni failed. That's not a Brian mm. Johnson failure. That's a Nick Sirianni failure. And if you listen to Love this coaching staff, failures. that's what yeah. you hear from person to person, from Dan Quinn to Josh Harris to Adam Peters to Joe Witt Jr. today. One of the things I loved about Joe Witt Jr. is he's hitting a whole lot of servant leadership uh, tenants on the head without sitting there and saying, this is me as a leader and this is who I am as a leader. Servant leadership means when my people fail, I fail. They didn't fail. I fail. But Nick Sirianni failed Brian Johnson. And then not only did that, did he do that, but then he fired the man. So, I mean, you know, say what it, you know, we can say we can talk about Nick Sirianni. A whole lot. Trust me, I got a whole lot of opinions on Nick Sirianni right now. But <laughs> the at the end of the day, what Brian Johnson is here to do is night and day compared to what he was doing in Philadelphia. Not only that, but now he's working for not one but two servant leaders and Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury. We're not working for Cliff Kingsbury necessarily, more of a lateral movement uh, there. But either way, he's working around a bunch of servant leaders that are going to make sure that everybody rises with the tide. Nobody's going to get left behind. Yeah, Absolutely. Fast, you, mentioned, you mentioned Bobby Witt. How pumped were you listening to that? There's no question in my mind about why Dan Quinn decided to bring him over here as defensive coordinator. Yeah. That dude, he could get me to do anything. I, I tell <laughs> you, I'll, I'll go commit murder for the guy. No, you won't. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> I won't but murder. It's funny because in years past, David, like Ryan Kerrigan being retained as pass rush specialist would dominate the news headlines, but all the names mm -hmm. have been acclimated here. It's absolutely mind numbing. Like Ken Norton, Daryl Tapp, uh, my goodness, going down the list, John sure, Pagano, Floyd, Joe Witt, Jason Simmons, it. but of all these um, uh, coordinators, all these coaches, who excites you the most? Mm. That is an interesting question. I will tell you that the fan in me, like the football fan in me, it's Ken Norton Jr. I mean, that mm. that takes me to my childhood and, and watching Ken Norton Jr. just destroy people on a football field. And I come from what I call, I call it a benefit, you know what I mean? But I come from a background where I don't have an NFL team. My favorite, my favorite football team of all time. Uh, plays in Frankfurt, Germany, so they don't belong to the NFL. They used to belong to the NFL, but they don't belong to the NFL anymore. Um, so I have the benefit from my NFL watching days of I get to fall in love with players. You know what I mean? And Ken Norton Jr. was a player that I loved watching when I was younger. So uh, I've already kind of said this to some of the other people on the beat, but like when we meet him next week and I meet him for the first time, like I'm going to have to make sure that I stay composed because I got to be a professional. But that's going to be a moment like – as a child, if you were to tell me, like, hey, man, you're going to be around football players and teams and all this stuff on a daily basis, that's one of the people that I would uh, put on my list that I, that I want to meet. The other, Another one was Steve Atwater, uh, who I met a couple years ago for the first time at a scouting combine. And that was why I didn't lose composure, but I did. I flat out went up to him and said, dude, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours, like you, the way you play the game. 
And Ken Norton Jr. is another one of those players. And the way that he played the game, the way that he coaches the game is the way that Joe Witt Jr. says he wants his defense to play. It's the way that Dan Quinn says he wants his entire team to play. So it makes all the sense in the world. Um, as far as on the offensive side of the ball, I really like the hire of David Blau. I mean, that one kind of basically just dropped today, and I think it's very interesting. Um, Bobby John or not Bobby, yeah, Bobby Johnson, I know is someone that a lot of people have a lot of feelings about, and, and I appreciate all those feelings, and I think that they're rooted in in some some valid areas. But I really think that Bobby Johnson is a guy who we're going to see the impact of this this holistic coaching staff approach that this team really has, right? So the mm-hmm. offensive line, if you're concerned about Bobby Johnson, like Bobby Johnson is not going to have his hands on the O-line and nobody else. You know what I mean? There's going to be like three, four different coaches influencing that offensive line. So if Bobby Johnson has deficiencies somewhere, which Cliff Kingsbury said that, you know, his reputation and everything precedes him and he's well-respected around the league. So, you know, I tend to kind of lean on that more than anything else. But even if those, you know, those those high regards for him around the league are are, are short-sighted, there's going to be enough other people around him. This is not going to be a single point of failure system. So even if you have concerns about Bobby Johnson, look at the other people, the run game coordinators, pass game coordinators, running back coach, all these other people, the office coordinator specifically. And again, Dan Quinn, the floater who can, if he needs to reach down there and grab an O-line coach by the scruff, he can do it. Mm-hmm. There's so many people here that if the O-line fails, it's not going to be on one person. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. The Bobby Johnson thing was interesting watching watching twitter explode about it but uh what well, and then you meant you mentioned ken norton but another person that people seem to be excited about is former washington redskin daryl tapp daryl tapp mm-hmm. out there leading the d-line how important is it do you think for and look i know ken norton was a former player but like daryl tapp was a former player recently so same with sheriff floyd right. the, the assistant defensive line coach how important do you think is that for four guys like jonathan allen and for these guys that are in the middle of pro bowl type careers to have a former player who really understands what they're going through yeah, you know, I think a true, a true. So I would say this: a true professional in the business of performing, right? So when you're on the the business end of things, when you're the one on the ground and in the trenches and all that stuff, I think what's important is you have to be able to understand your coach. And you have to be able to believe that your coach not only has your best interest at heart, but knows what your best interest actually is, right? Now, coaches like Daryl Tapp, coaches like Ken Orr Jr., Ryan Kerrigan, they have a little bit. I call, you call it a head start, but it's not a head start in the traditional sense because they sure, you know, they surely enough earned that head start, right? Uh, But they have a little bit of a head start in there being former players. Other players will automatically give them a little bit of credit. But I'll tell you right now, there have been former players that go on to coaching staffs and get run out of the building just as fast because it turns out that you may know what it's like to be in the trenches and get your head, your bell rung, but you don't know how to teach it. You don't know how to talk Mm -hmm. about it. You don't know how to communicate it. So at the end of the day, these guys, regardless of their playing history, they're going to have to be able to show these players that I can teach you and communicate with you and support you and I can set you up for success. But these guys come from 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 lines of experience where they've already shown that they have at least have some modicum of ability uh, to be able to do that. And again, going back, like this is going to be the theme of the entire offseason, the whole holistic coaching approach. Right. right? If, say, Daryl Tapp for some reason has a problem uh, uh, communicating with Jonathan Allen or Deron Payne or Federer Mathis or anybody else this is actually something I asked Coach Witt during today's press conference. What do you do? What's your approach when a player just isn't grasping what's being you know taught to them? And he said, if they're not grasping it, that's our fault. That's not their fault. And I love that because mm. again, you talk about leader or uh, servant leadership. You know, there's there's managers and there's supervisors that basically said, I told you what to do, you didn't do it right. That's your fault. And then there's le- there's servant leaders who say, I told you what to do, you don't understand it. How do I need to fix my approach to make sure that you do understand? Or how do we get to a point of understanding? And that is what Joe Jr. is is preaching. So if Daryl Tapp has struggles linking up with any of these guys for any reason or Ken Norton Jr., that's going to be incumbent on the rest of the staff, the other sub-coordinators, the defensive coordinators, and then again, Dan Quinn, to help develop those coaches to become better teachers of those players. Absolutely love it, dude. We had the same feelings from the press conference today. But to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you. One that I have, uh, Washington also hired uh, Lance Newmark from the Detroit Lions at 28 years yeah. of experience in the NFL in Detroit, obviously in the player development phase. What is his role going to be with Washington? So assistant general managers are kind of like run game coordinators and pass game coordinators. They're always different in different organizations. But in general, like any assistant general manager is at least going to be kind of a, a you want to call it a check and a balance because it's not really their job to make sure that Adam Peters is doing what he's supposed to do. But it's just kind of another set of eyes, another set of ears to make sure that everything is being checked and nothing's being rushed. I think that's really the big part of this. Like these guys have so much work ahead of them. Uh, you know, Coach Witt, Coach Kingsbury both kind of talked about they're only like three days in uh, of evaluating the current roster. And in those three days, Coach Cliff, uh, Cliff Kingsbury has only gotten through three games. Like 
we watch games, you know what I mean? And, and, and media is just as guilty as anybody else of doing this, but we watch a game on Fox or something like that. And we think, boom, we know everything that happened in that game and we're good to go. Oh, these no. coaches like just tells you how much time, I mean, these dudes are putting in 60 to 90 hours a week and he's only gotten through three games and you know what I mean? In three days and in and, and that type of a work stretch. So that just kind of shows you just how much they go through with a fine tooth comb. And they're not the only coaches doing that, but no, I'm, Adam sure, Peters they, also I'm sure there's times that. David where like they go through 15 to 30 minutes on one play. You know, just dissecting oh, yeah. what happened, yeah. you know? Yep. No, absolutely. I've, I've sat through film studies with some former coaches. Uh, Mike Martz is one that really uh, sticks out to me, Lewis Riddick, too. And these people, like, they will. Like, you will take one play, and you will literally sit there for half an hour to an hour and digest one play if you're if you're looking for specific things. So, I mean, this, is, this, this business is so much more intricate than a lot of people really understand. And in the process, you're getting ready for the NFL draft, and you're getting ready to try to figure out what free agents you want. So there's a lot of work that's got to get done. Uh, in a very short amount of time. So having an assistant GM, at least especially for this first year, without knowing what his exact roles are going to be, because, again, that can kind of fluctuate, it's going to at least be to make sure that the process isn't being rushed and that there's a fail-safe there to catch the things that fall through the cracks. Because, again, when you're trying to do this much this fast, something's bound to get loose, so that person's there to make sure that it gets tightened back up. My man. Now, David, my next question for you, what are we going to do at number two? Obviously, we could stay put. Uh, we could just – go with whatever quarterback you know is available with whatever the bears do or would you rather trade up or trade back and then just in your common sense mind what what's mm -hmm. the most best case what's most likely going to happen so i am my personal theology on football and especially nfl draft is the higher you're picking in the first round the more you need to be in love with the guy right so uh for the for instance like one through five that that guy is a starter as soon as you turn his name in like the second you write his name on a card that guy is starting for your team six through ten he's gonna be a starter by the end of training camp you're gonna you might have to fold him in a little bit but you expect him to be a starter from by by the end of training camp mm -hmm. 11 to 15 you're talking a quarter of the season then they're gonna be a starter 16 on you want them to be an impact player in the first year that's just kind of how i break it down personally when i when i start to develop my own opinions so that being said when I look at Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May, I don't see a franchise-changing quarterback in the bunch right now. Now, okay. truth be told, I've only watched two full games of each of those guys so far. I watch at least five before I even start to finalize my opinions, and I go to the scouting combine, and I like to talk to some other people that are smart in the business that I trust. So that being – and even then, I'm not going to be 100% correct, right? Nobody ever really is. So – that being said, my my opinion on those three guys is not fully solidified, but I do think it's Caleb Williams, number one, and I think Drake May and Jane Daniels, that competition and that conversation about who's two and who's three is really interesting because really it's about which flavor do you want more? Do you want more athleticism or do you want more of the pocket passer ability because one of those, that that's going to basically dictate how you want it. For me, if you're the Washington Commanders, if you don't love somebody – at number two, you don't take somebody at number two. That's basically how the way that I look at it. Now, if you don't love somebody at number two, you maybe trade back to number three if the New England Patriots do love somebody at number two. Let them come up, get the guy that they love. And now at number three, you might take somebody you like because you can afford to do that when you've got number 34 now in your back pocket mm. because of that trade. So that's kind of the, the way that I like to look at things. And when you look at the prospects of taking a player that could be successful versus will be successful, if you don't think they will be successful, if you're not to that point in the evaluation, then trading back even one spot gives you two bites of that apple. If if pick number three doesn't end up a success, if pick number 34 is a success, becomes a contributor or a starter to your roster, then you can go back and say what we did with that number two pick was successful, even if it took pick number 34 to actually make it successful, right? So – uh, that's and you know you don't need to be an analytics expert to understand that when you trade back and collect more picks you get more chances to win with that pick right so Eugene Chen obviously has an, has a history of trading back you know his organizations that he works for have a history of trading back but to me I think the the, the position that that pick is going to circle around the quarterback position I think that's the easy answer um, so by the time we get to the end of March not really even the middle the middle of March but like by the time we get to the end of March is Justin Fields on this roster? Is Kirk Cousins on this roster? Which Kirk mm. Cousins is not going to be on this roster. But <laughs> is there someone that you look at and you say, okay, that's the guy that they love right now um, versus you know maybe one of these draft picks? Doesn't mean there won't be a quarterback taken, but the more solidified the quarterback position is in Washington heading into April, the more likely you are to see a trade back. After, as of right now, as the roster stands with just Sam Howell and the way that the season ended for Sam, whether it's his fault, EB's fault, or a combination – you can't say that the quarterback's position is solidified in Washington right mm. now. So that means you have to go get a quarterback, which means that number two pick is going to be centered around whether you take one there, trade back, and take one later. My man, David, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out for us. The first time joining us on this show, and you very well impressed, sir. Before you get out, we just like to plug your social media <laughs> handle and your show, just in case anyone watching hasn't followed you yet and would like to, sir. 
Yeah, I appreciate the invite. You guys do a good job, so I appreciate you uh, you having me on here. Um, on Twitter, at dharrison82, if you want to go there. I'm not a great follow, to be quite honest with you. I don't really tweet all that much. Uh, but if you want to, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you over there as well. And then Locked On Commanders, five days a week, and uh, commandercountry.com for Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. Appreciate you. My man, David, have a great night, sir. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. David Harrison. That was a pleasure. My goodness, it, and I really do appreciate him coming on because yeah, he felt the same way about Joe Witt that I did, you know. And Joe Witt coming up there with sunglasses, I was like, "Ooh, feeling it." He got, yeah, the guy rules. He's so cool. Everything about him is so cool. He was just like, the way he talked was so cool. I just wanted to be just like him. I just want to follow him around and say, "Joe Witt, you're so cool. I want to be just like you." Yeah, and the latest news came out that William Gay and Darnell Stapleton are hired <laughs> as assistant coaches, which is awesome. Um, for William Gay being assistant DBs coach, so he's uh, teaming up with uh, Tommy Donatelli, who is the lead DBs coach. The Donatello. names on this. The names of this list are insane, but yeah, yeah. The I want to get one though. That's my favorite one. Since you won't be here with us for the full episode read, I want to get start answering, uh, asking you fan questions. And this one's from the Colonel. Question is: I was surprised to see the 49ers fire Steve Wilkes after the Super Bowl loss. Isn't that kind of a knee-jerk reaction by Kyle Shanahan? And would we be interested in hiring him in some capacity? I mean, obviously, come on, Steve Wilkes, come on down. We'll find a spot for you. That'd be awesome. No, but. It's that's one of those confusing things, man, because it definitely seems like it, it probably is. But at the same time, I mean, I, I saw some tweets from 49ers fans and I do think that they were right. I mean, they have more insight on it, obviously, than we do. But like the, that defense is so talented that they should be talented as hell. And apparently a lot of times the front end, the back end were communicating well. It just didn't really gel. And it's nothing against Steve Wilkes. It's just kind of that's just how it was this year. And but they are right. They should have been fantastic. Uh, I don't think you can blame Steve Wilkes for a lot of that. Look at what he did to Mahomes in the Super Bowl, uh, obviously before overtime. Like, I mean, they held, they them, held them pretty the, well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just one of those situations. It does come across as a knee jerk reaction. But and look, I can't believe I'm saying this. We don't know what goes on behind scenes. We don't know what how people gel. We don't know anything about that. So I'd like to think that Kyle Shanahan wouldn't just use him as a scapegoat but uh at the same time you never you never can tell what those sneaky sneaky shanahan's they're very sneaky boys sometimes and they, they make are their own rules and i know that everyone is looking at this in kind of a conspiracy theory uh, theory kind of way and I, I don't necessarily agree with that i think that there is um a strategy here because we do have to consider the fact that bill belichick is still out there and kyle shanahan most likely wanting to build that kind of staff on the other side of the football because if you look at spags in that super bowl what did they do to brock purdy they were able to get blitzes on brock purdy in crucial situations Some to be well time blitz yeah to yeah. help win that game did you get that from wilkes and that that's the only that's the only thing i'm, I'm not saying that steve wilkes isn't a good coordinator i'm just saying looking at it from somebody like who just looking at it as like a coach i guess you could say saying can i guarantee that the next time i get here will i get a better Pl uh, calling from that area and I can understand why saying if I have this option available that I know is championship caliber combined with my offensive mind I don't know why you wouldn't make that decision but that being said we are joined by our, our guest Mr. Douglas Big Douglas Show how you doing on this beautiful Thursday evening sir I'm doing well fellas thank you I was sitting here perplexed by the conversation I think I've probably jumped in it halfway so I'm not sure also was trying to figure out the board here. Looks like we have a walrus, maybe. There's Andy Reid right there. We have a there. guy over here with the cool shade. There's Andy Reid. There's Joe Biden. Is that Biden. why you were late? There's Joe Biden, and there's and there's Senior uh, yes. Donald J. Trump. Because it's a hair piece. Everybody, I, I got, I got shit are they sharing new, Are they sharing New Year's resolutions there? Yes. Yeah. Every every month, I, I write a new I, I write a new message in Trump's voice as a joke. Because look. The guy, I'm not into politics at all. The guy's funny. He he could be an asshole. The guy is funny. Wow, what a crowd this is! That's a, it, everything about him is funny. Okay. So I always try to write a little words of encouragement in his voice on the board. And, Probably uh, get sometimes a total I miss. opposite reaction. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I, uh, I yes, had, pretty much. I had yes, Danny Ru Danny Ruye was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He does a good Trump. Yeah, Dan, dude, Danny does get everything. Yeah, he Dan, is a really Danny's good so impersonator. Good. Yeah. But Doug, the One question the I was asked to uh, the question was asked to us by the Colonel was that he was surprised to see that Wilkes get fired after the Super Bowl loss. He thought it was a knee jerk reaction by Kyle Shanahan. Would we be interested in hiring him in some capacity? Well, I don't know if they will be, but they 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 are not adverse to hiring people you've heard of and giving them roles on the staff. 
I I think I tweeted something similar. I mean, you can kind of see where that's headed. I I doubt it probably, right? But I I tell you what, I tell you the one thing about the Steve Wilkes firing, like Shanny, that that's it for him, right? Like who comes next? Like yeah. I understand you had somebody had to go. I I guess was Steve Wilkes the guy that had to go, and and I don't know. Did Dan Quinn after you know after the stumble they had in the Super Bowl? Did he immediately? fire Kyle I don't recall no that's a good point and yeah. that, but my that's why I think with this that there is a future mindset here they already know what route that they're going in and look we can talk all day about how the the defense for San Francisco didn't play up the par and all that jazz but the fact is they did get up into this point and you need the defense to be able to get there and Wilkes did provide that and I don't how think many Wilkes, points did the Chiefs score in the first half I think it was Damn, what was thirteen? Yeah, it was, it was something small. At any rate, they. Yeah. I mean, he did a good me, job. They, they, didn't, they didn't lose that game because of Steve Wilkes. Just, no, 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 for no, sure. no. Right. And that's why I think it's just something different here in just getting more. Because like we talked about with Spags, where Spags called those well time blitzes, and obviously we could attribute that to Luck or just having a good game plan. In but those plays dictated the game there. And obviously we could talk all day long about the defensive staff and everything, but I think everyone can agree that the quarterback, obviously you could probably make an upgrade more so than defensive coordinator. If you're in San Francisco's opinion, I might be crazy in saying that, but it is how I feel. And, and Kyle, you brought up Spags real quick. It wasn't the blitzing. I think like the majority of the second half, they went cover zero with those blitzes and just went man to man. And basically if you rewatch the tape, they were just nasty, aggressive out there. I mean, it was oh, yeah. a physical, physical game, and, and they were hurting people. And that that cover zero was respect. Just do that and say we're just going to do it and see what happens. I thought it was incredible. Absolutely love it. That's how I used to call defenses a Madden dude. And now we are joined by our co-host, <laughs> Mr. Michael Hall. Let's how see. are you doing on this Thursday evening, sir? Pretty good. It's been a long day, but you know, a little late, but I'm here now. Well, it's yeah, about to get longer because you're going to have to listen to Kyle speak for the next 30 minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go to our Twitter for our fan questions. Big Doug, this is from our guy, Kevin Walsh, a.k.a. Sports Drunkies on Twitter. In a recent interview on The Pivot, Antonio Pierce gave credit to Magic Johnson for getting Cliff, King Cliff Kingsbury before he signed with Vegas. How much do you all think Magic is involved with the team and recruiting? I think famous people know each other. I think rich people know each other. Yeah, we all stick together. Across spectrums. I think <laughs> that guys that spend their entire lives in L.A. know each other. That was those guys. So, like, if Antonio Pierce says that Magic came in last minute and said, Cliff, you know, what are we doing here? I think I'll believe him. Right? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't help Antonio Pierce to say Magic Johnson – you know, Jack, the guy I wanted, but sure enough, he did. But and also, they they got another guy from the Raiders like three days later. So they, they Justin have been, Simmons, right? So I don't think they were too upset. But I, I thought it was interesting, and I love the candor with which you can get from podcasts these days. These guys are out there just telling it. I loved how Pierce said he was the head coach from the very first day. They kept trying to say, "When did you think you knew you had it?" And it was like, mm. "I had it from the day they gave it to me until the day that they told me." I won't have it no more, which I thought was great. Yeah, that is, is the best, dude. That is fantastic. It reads, yes, you all do stick together on Epstein Island. Um, yeah. but yeah, Kev us rich people, Kyle, you wouldn't know anything. Kevin, like, uh, like, I rich was... people are talking right now, Kyle. We got money. Over it's here. obvious <laughs> that Magic Johnson has a heavy influence in what is going on. Obviously, Cliff Kingsbury going being at USC last season and what that provides. Also, Magic Johnson being from LA, being in that area, it's easy to see where the connections would lie and fall into place there. I think Magic Johnson was smartly brought on for a very good reason and for this sort of reason, to bring glamour, to bring fame to where we are. I mean, like we just talked about earlier, Reed, like in years past, Ryan Kerrigan being retained would be the biggest news of the new coaching staff. The fact of all of these other guys being added here just shows you that the level has been raised completely. This is out of this world, and I think that each one of those owners uh, have a hand in I think Magic has a lot to do with the people aspect, without a doubt. What do you think? Not Paul? just that. I th I think that uh, with Magic like being having his hand in like all these different types of sports teams and whatnot, I think obviously he's going to know a lot of agents as well because those agents are going to represent a lot of those players in those That's other sports. Point. So that they're trying to close a deal on a guy, or they're like, "Hey, Magic, do you know so and so? Like, we're trying to recruit this player. We're trying to sign this player." 
Do you know his agent? Do you know so and so? Oh yeah, I know him through this guy. Say, this guy. All the answer guy. to that is always yes. Magic knows everybody. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Especially some exactly. So I think Magic's going to be that dude that please. like. Maybe they get him on like the on the conference call, like, hey, like blah blah blah. This is Magic. Like, man, really want you here. Just like, and at the end of the day, who can say no to Magic Johnson? So I think that, like you said, I think that's exactly what he's here for because he has such a knowledge of all these uh, other agents that are out there representing these other uh, players in different well, sports. Well, they win, right? He did it for the Dodgers, too. I mean, the Dodgers Do you, do you remember when – he touches just wins. I'll take that. Do you remember on the control verse when Kendrick Lamar said he was the king of New York and, and it caused a big fuss? Magic Johnson is literally the king of L. That dude is such a <laughs> staple in L.A. Like, I don't think people realize that. Like, of America. Was, yeah. Magic's one of those few guys. We talk about one percenters, but, like, Magic Johnson is the one percenter. Anywhere he goes – yeah, he immediately becomes the most famous person you're talking to right now. Yeah, so it's, it's Kanye Magic West of Johnson. Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. and we all know if you run the media, you run the world. So Magic Johnson basically runs the world because he runs Hollywood. He runs LA. It's true. It's a good so. point. Now the next question we have, Big Doug, Big Doug is from Twitter on Tony Franchise. Thank you, Tone. Do you think there is anything to the rumors of Washington looking at bringing back Kirk Cousins and Chase Young? Oof. These are uh, hot button topics in the uh, in the fan base. We know how Reed's going to feel about this. He wants to bring back Kirk. I love Kirk. Kirk. Well, what's the number for Kirk? I don't want to bring back. Is it I mean, forty? Uh, year, yeah. Are we doing one year at a time now because of the injuries at forty million a year? Just wanted a pop. I mean, he's, he's still better, I think, than anything we've had. I'd offer him sure. the same deal that Bruce Allen offered him twenty mil. What's up? <laughs> and, yeah, and, then, and then you'll get the yeah. same response and you'll be off the <laughs> that's true and, well. and, that, and that's easy listen Kirk Kirk's gonna always get loved and hated on in the fan base I think that's fair I think who knows what he is after the injury this uh, this franchise obviously isn't going in that direction I would be more than super stunned I think it's fine for him to come back the same people that are here aren't there anymore so like anybody's upset about I don't who's he upset at now, right? Those people aren't here. And as far as Chase Young, Chase Young to me is in the E B predicament. Like who where is Chase Young going next year and and for what? And and how much of it? And it won't be in Washington. And I th- I think Chase Young, I think Santana said it one time on a podcast, and it's like nothing is more difficult than playing at home. Like, yeah. It's just hard to understand that way. Not everybody's cut out and built for it that way. And I don't think I don't think it was good for Dwayne, rest in peace. And I don't think it's probably good for Chase. And it's why Kevin never came home, right? If people were so mad that Durant wouldn't give the Wizards even a sit down. I think it was more respectful that he told them they weren't getting a sit down. He want to play at home. Yeah, it did. I would. Doug, I would imagine neither come home. How about it, that? That's exactly right because you got to think about it this way. Have it? Has everybody here seen Everybody Loves Raymond? Right. Best. Every, right. Raymond obviously loves his mother a lot, but he absolutely hates the fact that she lives across the street from him and has any access to him at any point in time. Mm-hmm. We all love our mothers. We now all. She love does her. show up with good food from time to absolutely. time. Absolutely, but yeah. we <laughs> all understand what Ray Romano means, and that's why I do not. I don't look bad on Kevin Durant in that regard, but I'm just surprised you can understand Ray Romano when he speaks. It's so funny. funny. (laughs) I guess slightly better than your Trump impersonation. Nothing's better than that. Doug, watch your mouth. (laughs) Uh, But I don't think I don't think there's much. Wow. What a Doug. One thing I will say, Tony, is you're doing doing okay here on your podcast. Doug, you eat. (laughs) You can only I can only do the rally Trump. I can only do the wow. I walked in here. I said wow. What a big room. Oh, no, I can't do it. I can't <laughs> he said do you anymore. needed me here. I am. Let's do it. Right. I don't know. I don't. I don't have an issue in that department. I don't know. Maybe somebody else does. I don't. Uh, but Maybe. Tony, I will say this with Kirk. It would make sense that this organization and meaning ownership would try to right a wrong by bringing back somebody that probably shouldn't have ever left in the first place with everything that transpired. But honestly, it's going to be heavy. It's going to be a big price tag, and you're going to be taking out a lot of that cap for that player. And we've talked about many, many times, one of the reasons why this job was so uh, 
juicy, I guess you could say, to a GM and others because of the cap space and because of having a rookie quarterback on a rookie deal and not much money being allocated there, she could go down any route. By going down with Kirk, you're kind of kneecapping yourself in, in that standpoint. Anything, Hall? Yeah, no, I was going to make that point as far as like <clears throat> when Adam Peters came in at this press conference, he said they're going to build through the draft and supplement through free agency, and that will just kind of go against everything he said in the press conference when you give a big chunk of money to a quarterback and then you kind of still got to fill the rest of the roster out. So as much as I wish we're in that position where it's like, Hey, the team is like, when we're on the doorstep, like let's get a quarterback like Kirk. Maybe he's that guy to get us over to like over the hump or a quarterback like at Kirk's level. But unfortunately it's kind of like a, a retooling, like Dan Quinn said, but I think that, uh, yeah, the rookie quarterback on the rookie deal is, one of the most precious things in the NFL right now outside of a franchise quarterback. So you got to get that rookie. You got to find that rookie and hope that he hits and he's your guy for the next 10, 15 years plus. Yeah. And obviously prayers out to all the victims yesterday in Kansas city, uh, the three idiots who opened fire in the middle of a parade, uh, hitting a bunch of innocent people, kids, uh, just absolutely ridiculous. You know, I said some bad things on Twitter about that guys and I shouldn't have said that, but you know, it is what it is. I'm just saying, drop some elbows on them, man. Um, but I want to get in this next round of fan questions. This one's from King Commando, Doug. His second and third round targets based off of the staff that has been provided. Also free agent targets, excluding potential franchise players. So based on what the coaching staff is, your projection on some players that would be good in the second to third round. Well, I, well let's start here. I, I think it'll be interesting to see in the next couple of weeks exactly what it is they talk about doing on offense because I'm not sure that we know. Like, it, it, Cliff made it sit on purpose. I thought it was interesting that he wasn't like – like this. he's an air raid guy. I thought it was interesting that he kind of like distanced himself maybe just a little bit from that. Can I explain why? Why Please. I think – the reason being is that the air raid, I guess, in Cliff's mind is more so of a college football type of offense, whereas you don't need to rely on the run game as much because of the spacing that you are allowed. But the NFL in particular is its own organism, and the same sort of ways that work in college doesn't work in the NFL. And that's why Cliff is saying, sure, my offense, you could say it's kind of like air raid, but it's not because back when I was at Arizona, I, I, didn't, I wasn't throwing the ball more than anybody else in the league. You know, I was still running the ball a heck of a whole lot. So that's why well, he's that, saying you can't call I, my offense air raid. And I agree with that, and I mentioned that today on Twitter. If you can look at Lane Kiffin's version down in Ole Miss – they want to run the ball a lot and they pick up big yards because they've spread you out. So yep. again, I don't want the air raid to become like the same connotation that system manager gets right? game manager, right? Because I don't think that's it. You think you can still spread. They just want to get you as wide as possible. And I think that's the difference. <laughs> and so I'm not sure. All. That's, <laughs> that's right. I, I don't know. In the second round, I think, I think, they're, they got to look at – there's some DNs I think that could be there. I think will surprise some people. I think they should be looking at there. There'll still be some centers and guards there. I like – you know me, I'm a Georgia guy. I, I have a guy like Lad McConkey was still there, at wide receiver. That That is a that is a first down getter anywhere and so something like that. Uh, who's the – Adonai Mitchell is from Texas. Yes. Uh, through Georgia, but a six four guy that's gonna run four three. I thought it was I a Donnie. Maybe I was, that way. Maybe I had that wrong. Say it again. I thought it was a Donnie. Maybe I had that wrong. Could be. I well it where it is at an eye is a word. So I, I don't ever know how it's it uh, sounds cooler. <laughs> it sounds cooler. <laughs> <Right. lie. laughs> but um so yeah, I mean I could see those if if the center from Oregon is there, yeah. I could I could see that, you know. Um obviously they could be looking at tackle. I think guys like Mims are going to fly off the board high. You'd have to be looking maybe at the guy from Washington. Uh, I'm concerned about the kid. We had a guy on a couple of weeks back, maybe it was Tony Pauline, that said you know, they were concerned with everybody's favorite guy from Arizona that maybe he left the senior bowl looking more like a guard mm. and he did a tackle. Morgan. Uh, that's right. Uh, so, like, those are the kind of the names that you hear. And again, it all. Is predicated really on what they do with the first pick, right? Yeah. If, if they go quarterback, then you know kind of what you got to do. If they're trading back and making moves, I think it'll be interesting. 
Yeah. They got to add a guy like Bucky Irving from Oregon with some juice, I think, in the third round, maybe. I'm with it. Now, for me, for second or third round picks with this coaching staff, one thing that I took away from Dan Quinn's presser, I'm going to try to be as short as I can with this, but he talked about being physical, tough, finishing plays. When you're talking about the second to third round, you're looking at areas of need that you need to supplement. And the good thing about Washington is that we can literally go in any direction. If you truly wanted to add talent anywhere you wanted to, you could. If you wanted to go wide receiver, you could. Because wide receiver is very heavy in the top half of this draft. When, you, when you're at that top half, you can get a number one wide receiver that's tall and that's fast. And that's what more so I'm looking for. I respect the hell out of Ladd McConkey, And I think if he went to Kansas City, he would do, he would do record numbers like Wes Welker and Peyton Manning did in Denver. What I like to see in that second to third round is pass rush. But I also would like to see big, tall corners possibly looked at like TJ Tampa in the second round, possibly sure. even looking up into the first round. But when you're looking at offensive line, I need maulers. I need badasses. I need the type of player that gets his pinky bent 90 degrees to the right and is still out there blocking, trying to punch the guy in the face, even when he's looking like he's looking like this. I need tough M- MFers. And Jackson Powers is one of those that you talked about. Uh, Christian Jones is another one of those guys. Um, uh, Cooper Beebe, uh, BB is another one of those guys yep. that is tough as nails, just wants to drive you into the earth. And that's the kind of prospects that I'm looking at in those rounds. And I know Patrick Paul, Chris Paul's brother's there, but with Patrick, it's not near so as much with the tenacity and toughness he and needs, all that. Jeff. He needs a little development still. He does. But Doug, to your point, you could go edge rusher. You could go linebacker. You could go corner. You could go wide receiver. You could go tight end if you truly wanted to. You could go center, uh, guard, or tackle. And that's the, the roster beautiful- is in need mm-hmm. of an overhaul. Well, I'm not going to say it's in need of an overhaul, but I will say this. We're not in the position. How many blue chip players are on the roster, Call. I'm not going to say. I'll say this. We are not in a position to look away from adding talent. If that makes sense. Like, we're not at in a position to look down on position. anybody. Yes, I will agree with that. I, I'm, quickly, I'm not the. How many blue chip players are on the team? Blue blue chip meaning elite of the NFL, like top three at position? Even, let's say even top five. Top five of their position? How many top tens do we have? I would say, if you're I'd say Sam Way, Cosme's one. Tress Way, we have about two or three. Sam Cosme, you can say he's, he's like a he's a top five, top ten guy at his position. Who'd you say? Sam Cosme. I would he may, say, be, he uh, may be working his way into the top ten. Yeah, but I say Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, I think are because like if could you qualify them as the same position? Because there's a hell of a lot of defensive tackles, right? Because they're both they each play their own. But yeah. I think that you can make an argument for those two. And then obviously we don't need to get into Terry as much as nobody else will believe me. I do a, a think that he's top five. Uh, so, but I'll say probably two or three, including Tressway, if we're being nice about it. You know, it's just we did this exercise the other day because I I think it's easy to and we talk about all the salary cap. They've only got like 24, 25 guys on a contract right now. So like, yep. not even they got this money to go crazy on. They got to fill a roster out. And it just, I don't know. I was, I was a bit sad the other day when I looked at it. I was like, maybe the roster is not really as good as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. And that makes me sad. That's true. And yeah. obviously we have one blue chipper uh, that's still not under contract that we need to retain here. And uh, I hope that Joe Witt and others are watching that defensive film and seeing what I see. Uh, Because I hope that does happen. But, Doug, the next question is from our Discord from Deluxe. Who is your favorite hire of the coaches? Good question. That is a good question. I, well, well, I liked the Joe Witt. I have them written down if you need any names. I like the Joe Witt interview from today. And I liked that he said 34, 43, it doesn't really matter because yep. he's right. You're in that nickel most of the time. Yep. He said big – when he say Buffalo and people, I, I'm sure, were very upset. It was like uh, as long as he doesn't say position flex, I think people will give him a pass. <laughs> but I like that they're going to listen. I like that – the what I'll tell you this. I don't know if I have a specific hire in mind, but one of the things that I liked from Joe is that like each of them have two different points of reference, right? Like they are not all like, yes, Dan has brought people that he has known or wanted to work with before, but they've got like two or three points of references on a tree and that's it. And I like that. 
And he mentioned in the press conference today about having different minds, listening to different minds, yep. guys from different trees. That's the whole beauty of this thing. And so I think more than a specific hire alike, they've done it as a group. Now, these guys are going to have to come together quick, right? Because they don't have that kind of total experience together. Right. But I just like they've done it from a point of an egoless place, and I dig that. Yeah, and I think that that's very indicative of Anthony Lynn and Brian Johnson's job titles. I think that's very indicative. I think that's Anthony yes. Lynn putting his ego aside saying, let's make sure we take care of it, old boy, over here, uh, because he's coming over here and we need some, you know, a little bit, of, just saying. You know, They, I think, they asked who, maybe it was, um, not to cut you off, I think Stan did ask Witt today how long he'd been ready for this. And he laughed and he was like, I don't know why young guys are always getting the job, but I can tell you this, I've been ready for a long time <laughs> to get this spot right here being in charge of a defense. And that again, they're hungry and I love it. Absolutely true, dude. Uh, what about you, Hall? Um, <clears throat> yeah, outside of like the main guys, like the offensive coordinator, like Kingsbury and Witt, the defensive coordinator, just as far as the staff, I would have to go maybe like a guy like you just talked about Anthony Lynn, just because all the experience that he has, he talked about how he's been a head coach. He's been an offensive coordinator. He's willing to be like, you know what? I'll, I'll drop down a couple notches, go back to my roots as a running back coach slash like run game coordinator. And if you look at his track record with running backs everywhere he's been at, they've always produced. They've always been guys that have gone over a thousand yards. And I think that obviously we have Brian Robinson. If we can get a shifty guy in here, like the, like the add up, uh, like, like, you know, like a shifty type guys, shifty type running back, get him in here and kind of have that like thunder and lightning type thing going on. I think that uh, Anthony Lynn, and also he's a guy, he's a guy that's known to like pair the passing game well with the running game. And so maybe we, like I said, get back to like running the ball and working off that play action, which is great for a young quarterback. So I just think that, uh, yeah, I think if I had to choose one, I'd say Anthony Lynn, Anthony Lynn, just because of uh, his running back experience overall throughout his career. Yeah, and obviously uh, Randy Jordan, longtime running backs coach going down south, uh, and obviously a lot of respect to him and what he's done here. But look, if we're being – obviously, it's OG Bobby Johnson, bro. <laughs> Word on the street, I'm a suspect. Uh, no, but <laughs> if you guys know me, if you know my family at all, um, it's Daryl Tapp. Daryl Tapp, Virginia Tech Hokie. My family are huge Hokie fans. Been going to games when Vic was and D. Hall were playing. I saw them live. So having Daryl Tapp here as defensive line coach – is uh you know it's a circle coming back over and it's it's a beautiful sight to see but also the Daniel Blau uh David Blau thing is really interesting because of how much uh BJ was giving him credit what was going on there in Detroit and maybe we were able to have the um hindsight not the hindsight to be able the force foresight be able to see that this guy was going to be blossoming in Detroit and say well, you know what we'll just take that from you you don't want to get on mm -hmm. our jet that's fine I'll take your dude though you know what I'm saying uh, so for me, without a doubt, it's Daryl Tapp. Now the next question, Big Doug, this is from Deluxe. If you were a head coach, what team building activity would you do to kickstart the staff alignment and communication with the coaching staff, not the players? Well, first, I just want to say you mentioned the coach we didn't get, BJ. You boys should be real happy because if you had Reed talking about BJ every week, uh, it's huge, huge <laughs> trouble. Does. I just know that. Yeah. I think he does a huge bullet there. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what they'll do that way. I will say this. I guess Ron already had one. They stole the um talk about stealing. They stole the lady that is like the coaches Sarah the, Hogan. Yes. This yeah. to me was very interesting. She's the I chief did, of staff for coaches. Thank you. And apparently Ron had one, which I didn't realize. But <laughs> in the in the press release, Raheem Morris was very disappointed that she wasn't going to be around. So I, I, I think it's very interesting um, how big I mentioned on tour the other day too. And I know there's no cap, but the new owner is opening his pocketbook up for the coaching staff. And you've got to love it. How many times have I said, man, build a freaking juggernaut. And I'm glad that they're doing it. And what team activity. And I think it's very easy. But what, what I would do if I were the head coach if and I had to kickstart this coaching staff together is I would pick sele select coaches to be the house. And then those select coaches are going to bring those other assistants and other ones over to their house. So have two separate ones for each side of the football, and you're going to have poker night. And the reason for this is 
Poker Night doesn't need to be taken seriously, but it's a good way to see who can bullshit and who can't. To see how somebody plays, how they interact socially, what makes them tick, uh, certain things that make Deal, what they... Dealer's play. choice or straight Texas Hold'em? Texas Hold'em. Okay. And that way you can kind of really see how somebody can bluff, how they can't, because if, when the when the bullets are flying, you need to be able to trust that guy and what he's saying, that he has full confidence in what he's doing. You know, you, you don't want to s- listen to a guy who's in reality in his, in his body, in his mind, he's like the deer in headlights, like, oh, you know, like uh, in Waterboy. You know, he's about to kick the onside. He's like, where's my bitch? Oh, there's my <laughs> bitch. That kind of thing. Uh, so for me, it'd be poker. I think poker is a really cool thing, but it can't be all of them in the same room. It has to be more so of a very private, social atmosphere where people can open up. Maybe some drinks start flowing, some things start uh, burning, and people get talking and everyone. It's a good start to what you have going because you don't want it to be a negative on the first start, right? You want it to be a happy, kind of celebratory, no stress kind of thing. And that's why I think poker would be really good in that breath in communication. Yeah, um, I would just say maybe like a top golf type thing because, uh, you know, a lot of NFL coaches, I know, just like the generic thing. But, you know, NFL coaches love golf and stuff like that. So, But I'd also say like maybe the first person on the staff that has their house set up and, you know, is already established in the area, maybe they have everybody over, bring their wives or family and whatnot, have like a cookout. Like you say, the drinks start to get the flowing. Guys start talking, let their wives uh, hang out, talk. You know, get to know each other. So maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really. We we could combine them. We could combine our two ideas. Yeah, you can have the poker night while that's going on. Yeah, there you go. That way, yep. That way, yeah. Good job, dude. Last question. This one's from Tim Towner, Doug. If we want to, he asked this three days ago, and we kind of already talked about this. But what are the odds that Kirk Cousins signs with San Francisco? I don't think so. Kirk, I think Kirk's going to be interesting. I think the natural fit for him is to go back to Minnesota. I think maybe they're ready to reset. And look, this high quarterback number, I think is going to hurt a lot of guys like this going forward. The nice thing for Russell Wilson is he's going to get cut outright. So he's going to get all his money. He could go somewhere for the vet minimum if he wanted to. So I think it's, I think it's really, well, I mean, I don't know how big how big of an upgrade from Purdy is Cousins. I I know they've wanted to have this connection forever, but if it's me, like if I'm paying Purdy the vet minimum and I got to pay Kirk Cousins 40 45 a year, I just got to the Super Bowl without paying that. So I I don't know. I think it's really interesting to see what happens to Kirk Cousins and a bunch of these guys with big price tags. Look, one thing you could say about one thing you can't say about Kirk is that he's dumb because that oh, is he got paid. That dude is smart. He did it the right way and he got paid regardless. You guys could crap on Kirk Cousins all you want. He's That's still fine. he's still starting in the league. Teams still he's want his bag, ass in the uh... league. <laughs> he still talk crap, but the fact is he's still getting paid. And that being said, I wouldn't put it past him to want to go to San Fran. And he talked early in the offseason saying that money is not really uh, his motive at this point. And it wouldn't surprise me if he did take a major pay cut to go with Kyle, to go with Trent, and be able to kind of finalize what they started. Because we we know Kyle Shanahan obviously loved Kirk Cousins. Legend, the elephant in the room, we know that for a fact. And if the stars are aligning, so to speak, for both of them to make the connection, I think they'll both do what they need to to make sure that happens. Kind of like um, uh, Sean McVay and Matt Stafford in Cabo. You know, I was stunned. I'm, I was stunned that after Kirk got that from Minnesota, that that every quarterback deal after that wasn't fully guaranteed. Like I know that's what he wanted. He had told Bruce, right? And that's yep. what Bruce refused to do. He did not want to be the first guy. You to know get what a happened? Fully guaranteed contract. That's right. They didn't want basketball contracts. Yep. I really thought after Kirk got it that everybody else would demand it, and they just didn't, and that always surprised me. Think, Kirk is the ultimate finesser. Well, it's he because the be. NFL kind of said, okay, well, let that douchebag get it, but nobody else is getting this, okay, because this is going to be a problem later down the line. We're not allowing it. All right. Well, Deshaun Watson did get a fully guaranteed. Oh, that's there, true. So. You're right. And they're hating And they're hating that life. Yeah, yeah. But now, um, <laughs> Who is it? Chance that he goes to San Francisco, I'd say it's like, Two percent chance. I think that uh, they got Brock Purdy. Obviously, like it wasn't Brock Purdy's fault in the Super Bowl that they lost that game. Like 
I could see if Brock Purdy played bad or maybe he had like a Jimmy uh, Jimmy G type moment where he missed a wide open guy downfield that would have iced the game or had them go up or something like that. So uh, he played fairly well or he played be- better than fairly well. He played pretty good. He, he, he did played play good well. in the Super Bowl. But the fact is, Hall, that you had the Chiefs. You had them. Yeah, you had that's what them. the Chiefs. That's what the Chiefs do. They're they're like the Undertaker. Well, and you the think point they're down, is, they rise up. Like, and the point is, the quarterback couldn't make the necessary plays when he needed to. We've seen Pat Mahomes and other quarterbacks when they get blitzed. But you can say the same that, thing. It always goes both ways because the defense couldn't make the and necessary they find stops that open when they needed to. But so my point is, is that Trent Williams and others who are older guys are looking at this saying, "Coach, is this truly the guy who can beat a, who can beat quarterbacks like Pat Mahomes?" If we, I, I like your but analogy. On that other hand, though, guess what? You got a bunch of free agents, a bunch of guys that you need to pay coming up on contracts. You bring a guy like Kirk Cousins in, you're not going to be able to pay everybody. So well, that's what I mean about the money. If he if he's more so wanting to win and not wanting to get paid, like you said, cut. but I don't I don't I, I don't trust him. I, you know? There's already like rumors. Like, who knows if it's true or not? Probably not. But there's already rumors out there. Justin Jefferson is like, I'm not signing that big contract, so I know what we're going to do with the quarterback situation, aka like I want Kirk here. So. Like you said, he's talked about taking a pay cut. He feel I feel like he's comfortable in Minnesota. He's already kind of established. His kids are pretty, basically kind of grown up in Minnesota at this point. I feel like he's one of those guys where he doesn't want to uproot his family, and he'll just take a little pay cut in Minnesota to build a better team around a guy like Justin Jefferson and whatnot, and hopefully get him over the hump in the NFC. But I'm not saying I mean, Kirk Cousins is a bad father. All I'm saying is I think Kirk Cousins for a Super Bowl – would uproot his family tomorrow if he had. I but there's no, there's no guarantee that you're going to go to San Francisco and win the like, Super Bowl. I know, I know. But, but you know what a, I mean, though. And but Kyle, your your example of of McVay upgrading from Golf, who I think is criminally underrated, who went to a Super Bowl to Stafford to try to win one. Right. That's what they do. The other thing I'll point out about Purdy is, Purdy never left the field without a lead. Hmm. In that game, Purdy was up every time he left the field. That's yeah. brutal, and he lost. Yep. But that's also that's what Kyle Shanahan does. It's just three times in the Super Bowl he's lost the lead. And again, you can always look at it like, oh, they couldn't get a job done. They just needed a field goal. He couldn't make the throws. You could also look at the defense. You're up. You you have the lead. You couldn't make one stop. You couldn't get. You well, know what I'm saying? So it goes both ways. That I'm talking in more detail, though. I'm talking about I being know, able to see the blitzer, knowing what formation's coming at you. And well, that comes with experience, though. It's, well, you know well, what I'm that's saying? my point. And that's my point about Kyle Shanahan wanting possibly to have bring Kirk in because he knows he doesn't have to worry about that experience of being able to see. He knows what Kirk is looking at. So what's he, the percentage you said, Kyle? Uh, what did I say? 51%? The, the only reason the 51% is literally because of Kirk Cousins saying he doesn't want to So what are you going to do with Brock? Are you just going to trade Brock Purdy where? To Minnesota? No, I think he's going to stash him on there. Because of the quarterback issues that they've had with injuries and shit, you don't want to. You're not, they're, they're not about to bring in. Like not, I mean, outside of like, I know there was that report that they were trying to get Tom Brady in, whatever, blah, blah, blah. If I'm Brock Purdy, I'm like, okay, that's Tom Brady. If you're looking, if, if Kyle Shanahan came to me after Kirk Cousins has been in the league all this time, never made a Super Bowl, I've been to two NFC championships, which he also hasn't done in his career. That's true. He come to me and say, "Hey, we're gonna stash you for a little bit. We're gonna bring Kirk in." Hell you know what I'd say? no! You know what I'd say? No. You know what I'd say? Like, you... Okay, Brock Purdy, come on, throw the pitch down and get the <laughs> f- out. That's what I would say because you know why Brock Purdy's not and replicating you know what that happen? anywhere if Kyle else. Shannon, anywhere if Kyle else. Shanahan don't make the NFC championship, you know what's gonna happen? He's out. Oh, right, of course. Get the f- out. Well, though, that's you know, what I'm what saying, you, you know what the comparison there is, which is crazy, and I didn't even realize this? Greg Olson's been so good, they're stashing him for Tom Brady. Ah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one to all year. Game Kevin Burkhardt and everything. That one thing about San Francisco yeah. is is that John Lynch is attached to Kyle. So They're and, both going to be gone because they're going to be like, oh, you signed off on this, and exactly. we got worse? Bye-bye. And that's my point is that both guys are invested in winning right now. And so instead of settling with Brock Purdy, they might be under the mindset of saying, we need to get it done because our jobs are at stake, both of us long term, which would make a lot of sense. But like you said, the money is the big cog in it because San Francisco doesn't have that much. And Kirk obviously wants his bread. But if he truly is saying, I don't want bread, then, yeah, it is that high. But the more he wants, the less my percentage goes down, Doug. But that's the only reason, because I just feel like. That is a good – this is the only time that the stars have aligned, so to speak, for both parties, which would make sense because we know the the love affair is there. We know it's there. 
Yeah. All right, boys. That's going to wrap us up for this inter- uh, episode. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate you, man, for coming on with us last minute, yeah. man. I always appreciate your thoughts and your uh, your analysis of the team, brother. But before we get out of here, I'd like to plug your social media handle and your show, just in case anyone watching hasn't followed you yet would like to, sir. Sure, of course. Appreciate it. We do a uh, big Douglas show across all media. It's, uh, I think it's Doug McCray NFL as my Twitter handle now. We do uh, we do Monday shows with George Carmi. Tuesdays we do the uh, the film reviews with Mark Bullock and Nick Ackridge, which are always good. We do uh, the, it's Doug uh, McCray NFL is your uh, thank you. Deck. It, I changed it at some point. I don't remember when, but <laughs> Wednesday we do the the college shows, which we always uh, which are always good without an an even. And then it's usually just me on myself on Friday, and who knows what's who knows who might stop by. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just everybody apparently coming on Big Doug's show because Big Doug is the man to get shit done. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in for this episode of Brass Knuckles by the Burgundy Zone. Uh, Reed, thank you for tuning in and, and joining us as a guest for this show, Reed. I really do appreciate it. And also, thank you to David <laughs> Harrison. He really was awesome. A uh, really good guy from Locked On Commanders podcast. So make sure you go and check that out. And then also, Hall, thank you, man. for. I know you had the doctors. You came on late and you still hung true with us. Can't thank you enough, man. All right, everybody. We'll see you guys again on Sunday. Enjoy these fantastic coaching staff, this juggernaut of a coaching staff. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. And we'll see you guys on Sunday. Have a great, safe weekend. Thank you, Doug. You're the man, bro. Watch your football. Woo! What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with t-shirts, hoodies, and zip up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.